And what? Oh, wait. Yes, we're ready to get going. Uh, good, good morning. We're here today with Mr. Mike Berna, who is a veteran of World War II. Outside, it's a beautiful, clear, crisp, late November day. We're glad to be inside here. It's a little bit warmer. We're going to talk to you today, as I mentioned before, about your experiences before the war, what brought you into the service, and a little bit of what happened to you after and how the war impacted on your life. And as you were mentioning as the cameras came on, we're really happy to be doing this because we're losing our World War II veterans. And it's very important for all of us to get your story and to make sure we say thank you for what you did. What is the number that you were going to say are, are dying each day, World War II veterans? We're losing? Uh, over a thousand. Yeah, that is something. Yeah. 16 million, and now we're down to probably under 4 million. Well, how did, uh, how old are you today? I'm 82. 82, when's your birthday? June the 8th. Okay, so you just passed your birthday. Right. Yeah. Uh, where'd you grow up? In Roscoe, PA. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. And where'd you go to high school? California. And you graduated? In uh, 42. All right. And what were you doing? Uh, what is your memory of what you were doing when the war started? I can't recall really, but uh, all I know is I remember hearing it on the radio. We had just come home. It was a Sunday morning. We had just come home from church. Uh huh. And uh, we stand there by the heater getting warm because it was a pretty cold day. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I remember hearing it on the radio, and it was quite a shock to hear that the United States was attacked. Did you expect it at all? Did you have any inkling? Was from the newspapers, from the things that were going on, that you that their war might be coming? No, I mean, we never paid that much attention to the news at that time, you know, we were young and... Yes. <laughs> well, what were you doing with your life? What was your, how, how, how was your daily life like uh, at that particular time? Well, after 1942... Even before uh, that, when you yeah. were in high school, what, what did you do? Did you, did, did Not you? too much. Like I said, it was uneventful. I played in the high school band. Okay. And uh, that was about the extent of it. What were your plans? What were you going to do in, in, uh, after high school? I didn't really have any plans at that time. Okay. Uh, when it come to graduation, I was in a hospital, and I didn't, uh, you know, get to graduate. Well, what did it, happen? I got uh, appendicitis. Oh, my. And uh, they rushed me in uh, 2 o'clock in the morning to Mercy Hospital in Pittsburgh, and that's where they operated the next day. Okay. Obviously, you were okay. I was okay after that. But, uh, I never got to march down to get my diploma, though. Did you get a diploma? Did you? Eventually? Oh, I got one. Yeah, yeah. They, they delivered it to me in a hospital. Well, that's good. You know, there, there was a there's a now program for a lot of guys that were in that situation who left to go into the service, wherever, who didn't hang around to get their diplomas mm -hmm. to make sure that they can go back and and, and get them. Uh, well, I had finished my schooling. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you got your diploma. Yeah. And did you go to work? Were you after high school? Uh, after I got out of high school, let's see, I got out in uh, May, and in August I went to work. Where'd you work? I worked down, it started with Shaw Roy down at Corning Glass Works. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. And I uh, went down, <laughs> I went down to apply for a job, and before I got home they were calling me to come to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> So that uh, in those days, you know, they needed everybody they could get to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there were lots of, like, those kinds of laboring yeah. jobs in the valley. So I worked there up until the time I was uh, inducted. Okay. Let's talk a, a little bit about that. How did you come to join the service? I was inducted. You were, you were, you were drafted? Or did drafted, you okay. You were, you were drafted? Yeah. Okay. When, when did you get your draft notice? Uh... Let's see, I'm trying to think. 
Oh, how old were you? We can we can focus on that. I, I just turned 18. Oh, right after that? Right after that, I got my draft notice. And uh, I went for an examination on Pittsburgh. Okay. And it just happened at that time that uh, from Corning, from working in Corning, I had some blisters on my knuckles. And we went through the examination, and I kept that hand behind me all the time. It was wrapped up. <laughs> I never will forget that we come back, and you had your choice at that time whether you wanted to go to the Army, Navy, and Marines. So they asked me where I wanted to go, and I told them the Navy. So they stamped my papers, USN. And I reached for them with that hand that I held behind me all that time. <laughs> he said, what's the matter with that hand? I told him, I said, that's nothing. Well, so then I had to come back a month later. They told you come back in a month. But they changed my designation to uh, uh, hold for special assignments, what they put on my name. At that time, we, you know, we were wondering what the heck special assignment yeah. was. But we found out later it was uh, CBs. OK, we'll get into that in a second, because I want to talk about this business of the hand, because it tells me a little bit about your attitude. Were you anxious to go? Uh, Obviously. Yeah, I wanted to go. You did? All my friends had gone, and uh, most of them, you know, they yeah. were all in the service already, and yeah, I wanted to go too. It didn't ever occur to you that that might be a way to get out or no, delay? No. Uh, so it was your duty? Yeah. That's what you figured? Your duty to go? And right. And it was it uh, relatively minor? Um, the yeah, it was just blistered. Yeah. It was blistered a little bit from the yeah. heat. Okay. Yeah. What it was, I was a gatherer down at Corning, and the fire had gone down a little bit on the furnaces, so they turned it up. And when they did, well, every time my hand got close, yeah, they just uh, drew a blister. Didn't even think about it probably when you were working. Oh, uh, -uh. big yeah. difference in the, today, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Safety laws and things. So you go and and and, and the, that delay of a month coming, and having to come back. Do you think that affected? Your assignment, you said because it may have yes. Isn't that something? How fate works. Yeah. Now, you mentioned this special assignment was in the CBs. Tell us a little bit about what the CBs are. The CBs are the Navy Construction Battalion. Okay, where does that term come from? Because I did a little research and I found it kind of fascinating, and, and I'm sure that anybody watching this interview will want, want to know about that too. Well, I, I don't know how it come about, you know, because it was already organized by the time I got in there. Well, the, the it it's it's C S E A, right? Yeah. B E E S. -E -E -S. Yeah. And if I from some of the symbols I saw, they actually had like a, a bumblebee. A bumblebee with a tool in each. Yes. And leg. That C B S was a play on words, wasn't it? Yeah. For, uh, for, for the letter C and the letter B. Yeah. And what did the C and the B now, our uniform had a C and a B on a sleeve. Okay, and what did that CB stand for? Construction Battalion. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it. Now, okay, yeah. so CB, Construction, construction battalion. battalion. So Naval Construction Battalion, yeah. and that, then they became the nickname the CBs. Right. And from that, I guess that that's what you were involved in, um, building things and uh, yeah, doing well, that kind yeah. of work. Do you think you were given that assignment because of your civilian work, working in a factory? No, I think it was, a, at that time, there was a need for the people, you know, for the type of people that uh, they wanted to put us in, the type of uh, work they wanted to put us in. So they just needed a body. Yeah. To put it right. We need a body in here. <laughs> and you're going to do this and... They can train you. Right. <laughs> um, now, let me ask you this, because I, I, did, I did a little bit of reading on this, and I always want to ask the experts that went through it. Did... When you got into the CBs, did you talk to or did you work with any guys who had been there before you, who before your group was drafted, who had been there for a year or more? No. Because I originally, I read that originally the CBs was an was a all volunteer group, and that uh, uh, you had to enlist in that particular group, and they were only picking tradesmen and craftsmen. Right, certain tradesmen, right? Oh, so that is true. Then they yeah. did do that. But things had changed dramatically. Things changed when they needed more bodies, they needed more people, and uh, yeah. more work to be done. So, you know, they drafted into it. The foreman, the, the sergeant, or I'm not sure what the uh, the rank is in the Navy, 
but the uh, uh, the leaders of your groups and all that were they more skilled people? Were they older people? Or were they the same? Yeah, they were the skilled same? people. They were skilled in certain trade. They were either bulldozer operators or crane operators or something on that order. Okay. All Heavy right. equipment operators. Okay, so they trained you guys. Yeah, no, we we got trained in a different different field than what they were in. Okay, let's okay. talk. Can we talk a little bit about your training now? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, then I generally. As you started to tell me, and I interrupted you because I was so fascinated, I needed somebody to explain that CB to me. What was the general work of the uh, construction battalion in the Navy? What what kinds yeah. of things did you do? Well, construction work, building, uh, you know, uh, building airstrips, airstrip. building wharfs, piers. Uh, anytime they needed construction work done, it's very similar to the Army engineers. Okay. That gives me some a point yeah. of reference for me. I appreciate that. Uh, and and when you went in, how, what did you go through in terms of basic training or advanced training to prepare well, you to do this job? Six week of basic training down in Camp Perry, Virginia. Those, from what I, I read, that was one of the, one of the two camps where they where they trained the CB. Yeah, the in other I believe was Gulfport, Mississippi at okay. that time. But uh, we went through Camp Perry uh, basic training for six weeks. Then we come home on leave for seven days and went back to Perry and had six weeks of advanced, what they call advanced training. And all this was done, all this training was done under Marine instructors, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, they were sort of unhappy that they had to stay here. They wanted to go over and fight. But uh, they had to stay here and train us and they were sort of happy and they took it out on us. And I mean, we had some rough training was was it necessary do you think or just like you said as a result uh, of know, this personal did it help uh, it helped yes okay you know you got to develop uh, a machine a fighting machine yeah irregardless of where you're going to put that man what kind of job you're going to put him in you still have to develop a fighting machine because hey you're going into combat zones and you you got to protect yourself that's an important thing that i, I should have asked uh I know the Army engineers, they were expected. They carried rifles. And, yeah. and did you guys, were you issued weapons? Did well, you? yeah. I was a Browning automatic rifleman. Well, that's a machine gun. Not a, yeah. a, a that's a portable machine yeah, gun, if you want to put it that sure. way. Sure, yeah. I, I'm making sure I had that in yeah. my mind. That was a heavy thing to carry around. 17 it? pound. <laughs> plus the ammunition. 21 pound loaded. That's plus the ammunition. Well, that's what I'm saying, 21 yeah, pounds. Right. And then you had to carry so much ammunition. Yeah. So they trained you almost as a, a rifle squad besides. Right. So at any given time, mm -hmm. you guys could have been pulled in. We'll talk about whether or not that happened or if you knew anybody down the line. So you not only had the training in terms of the work you were going to do, and you also had to augment that with, with combat training right. too. And so that's why the Marines uh, were doing both of these things at the same time. Okay. So. What was your, besides that, uh, being a, a, a Browning automatic rifleman, uh, what, what other specialty did they particularly train you in? in, in well, our, our, our job, or our specialty, as you put it, was uh, loading and unloading ships. And we were assigned, well, we'll get into that probably later, but we were assigned to a big uh, naval base down in New Guinea. Okay. Well, eventually. Yeah. Yeah, we'll take our time getting overseas because this is all fascinating. Okay. I'm enjoying hearing all of this other good stuff here. I know you got some really good stories about New Guinea I want to hear, too. Um, so you spent six weeks in Virginia. You got to come home for a week. Right. And then you went back for Virginia for, for another enough. six weeks. Okay. And, and then we went to California. Okay. To uh, Port Wainemi, which was a uh, for more training. Okay. Okay. So kind of just the same sort of training, uh, it's yeah. not just advanced on, on this, nothing special. Just getting better all the time, you know. Yes, yes. Picking up the pieces. Kevin, can you remember what uh, time period we're into now? Is it uh, you in 42, 43? Well, let's see, 42, 43. It was in 43, I know. that. Uh, okay. We went, I think it was in April of 43 that we left for Wainemi, and we spent six weeks there. Okay, that's good. That just gives me a time frame mm -hmm. because, obviously, uh, with the wars, you know, progressing uh, and more and more need for, for more and more people overseas. So uh, you spent 
just about 18 weeks in training then, if I got yeah. that right. And then, and then what happens there? And then we went to, uh, from Wainaba, we went to San Francisco, boarded ship, and went overseas. So that seven-day trip uh, home was the last time you got to see your family? Right. Were you able to keep in touch with them? Did, did, oh, they, yeah. did they know when you were being shipped out? Or? Well, we couldn't tell them when we was being shipped out. You know, everything was. I saw some letters that I had written, and they had quite a few slits in them. You know, everything had to be censored. Yeah. And uh, what, what was uh, critical or important, they cut out. So we didn't have a chance to say too much outside of, hey, we're okay, and talk to you later. That's about all it was. Well, yeah, just to let them know that, mm -hmm. that, that you were, were shipping out. I mean, I, I can understand that. They were worried about spies and people checking on those kinds of things. They censored your letter. Somebody kept those for you, you said? Uh, my sister, I, I didn't know it till I came home from the service, and she had some of my letters in a box. That's nice. And uh, but, uh, they're gone now. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> The, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren would have loved to look at that. that and, yeah, what and happened, she had them in a box in a garage, and we had a big flood that one year, and just everything got ruined. What a shame. So, but you still got a lot of it up here, which well, is, which is really great. There. Yeah, that, that's a I managed to keep one, one letter myself. And uh, again, it's something that happened while I was overseas. My father passed away while I was overseas. And it was odd that when I was leaving, after that seven-day leave that I talked about, when I was going back, I told everybody so long, but I told my father goodbye. And he said, not goodbye, he said, so long. And he passed away while I was overseas. Isn't that something? Hindsight, yeah. looking back. I, I, um, I, I've heard similar stories from some from different people that you talk to, almost like a, not a premonition, mm -hmm. but a feeling or something like that. So that was the last time you got to see your, your dad yeah. then, and of course you couldn't have gotten back for the funeral. How did they let you know that uh, he had died? The only way I found out was my sister wrote me a letter, and it took two weeks actually for me to get that letter. Wow. I got it on Christmas Day. What news? Yeah. What news? And I still have that letter. And that's the one you mm -hmm. say? That, that really is something. Yeah. So now you're on a ship heading out of San Francisco, heading toward where? Uh, we didn't know. Let's okay. put it that way. Yeah. We had uh, this was inklings, this troop you know. Ship that you were telling me about before. It was a uh, former Italian luxury liner, and uh, we were on a, on the ocean for 17 and a half days. Let me ask you a little bit about that. I've talked to some people. They said they used those ocean liners because they were fast. Is, is besides the fact that they were so big, was were, were you by yourself just in that all ship? Along. There was no nobody S with uh, us no all along. Okay. Figuring that they could outrun the submarines. <laughs> I don't know. We zigzagged. I know that. Okay. We were told we were zigzagging on a zigzag, zigzag course. And uh, when we did get on deck, we would watch the radar. You know, it's continuously scanning the ocean. We're hoping that thing didn't stop someplace. Yeah. Well, yeah. But uh, we went down and. Uh, no, no, no problems going over. See? No. How about weather? Weather we had. Beautiful weather. I mean, the sea was as smooth as glass till we hit the Coral Sea, and then we hit big storms. How'd you weather that? How did you handle that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you get sick? It, I was sick when we started out, but I got over that. Because uh, uh, you know, a lot of those guys tell me that they can remember the trip over, the trip back, because of the terrible seasicknesses yeah. that they that they suffered. But you got you didn't seem to have to deal with that at least. Well, I dealt with it for, when we first started out, uh -huh. I got sick. Yeah. And an old sailor took me up to the mess hall. He says, come on the mess hall. I said, no, I'm not going. I'm sick. So he says, come on. So I went up and what he did, he put a big garbage can beside me. He said, now you eat and you puke till it stays down. After that, I was sick no more. An old sailor. <laughs> an Obviously old sailor, he right. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're just past 18, <laughs> not even 19 yet. Right. So pretty neat trick. So so you don't know where you're going. You're out in the middle of the know, ocean. We, and we had heard rumors, you know, that uh, the code name of the place we were going to was Edor 28. I remember that. And all our, all our equipment went by another boat, incidentally. It didn't come with us. It went on a separate boat. 
your equipment, meaning trucks and bulldozers and... Uh, bulldozers, the equipment, and uh, your uh, uh, ammunition, and your rifles, weapons. and all that, supplies. Okay. They all went on a different boat. Okay. Although our rifles, Matt, we had with us. Okay. So you had to lug this big, uh, heavy rifle. I had to lug it everywhere I went. <laughs> How much did you weigh at that time? I weighed 150 pounds. That's what I was thinking, probably. Uh, and I had to carry, plus that rifle, I had 60 pounds on my back. Jeez. Because that's what a backpack was. So with that fully loaded rifle, you're carrying over 80 pounds. Yeah. More than half your <laughs> weight. <laughs> I'm thinking you might have to drag that through the jungle. Yeah. Jeez. A lot of talk going on between the guys as you were going over about what might you might be getting in or or was it just no it was great? just you know we take each day as it comes yeah that's the advantage of being the, young. Uh, the only disadvantage we had going over is we got two quarts of water a day one quart we had to use our helmet you had to take you had to brush your teeth wash your face take a bath and wash your clothes with one quart of water. <laughs> and the, the other quart of water you got to drink. One quart, two quarts is hardly yeah. enough to drink in a day, right. let alone. See, that's just a fascinating little story that I've never heard. And uh, uh, obviously because of the shortage of yeah, fresh water. Yeah, because of the amount of people on yeah, that. Yeah, so many know. people. How many were on that ship, do you remember? Uh, yeah, I'd say close to 10,000. Okay, well, yeah. Two quarts for 10,000 people a day, that's a yeah. lot of water they were having that's to purify. That's a lot of water, right. They, you know, what they had to do, they had to generate that water, too. Right. You don't carry it. Right. Yeah. So the desalination yeah. treatment in the ship itself, so I can see. But you may do with all of that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Getting across there. Probably a little bit dehydrated by the time you're done. Uh, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that's what I said. Those are the fascinating little details that... Uh, may seem insignificant to you, but are just really, really neat stories to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, how, you were on there, I forgot how many days you said? 17 and a half days. I thought you said 17 and a half days. And where did you end up? Where did you end up? Well, we stopped off at uh, New Caledonia. We laid over there for a day, I think day and a half, while they got some of the troops off, some of the other outfits. And then we went from there up to Milne Bay. And where's that? New Guinea. Straight on the to southern tip of New Guinea. Straight to New Guinea, no Straight stops to New in Australia. Guinea, no stops, huh? Okay. What, uh, what was to be your job? What, what was uh, your purpose in, in going to that particular place? Did they tell you anything? No, they didn't tell us. Like I say, uh, you know, we were there to load and unload ships. Uh, supplies coming in, we unloaded, and supplies going out, we loaded. Is that a staging area? Yeah. That particular? Mm -hmm. particular? It was a big naval base. Okay. Now, let's if I could do a little bit of general history because you're in the Pacific Theater and it's 1943 and you're on the southern, southeastern tip of New Guinea. Right. Okay. And Australia sort of sets here and New Guinea's right up above there. You're down here on the southeastern tip of, of New Guinea. Now, the Japanese still occupied a big chunk of that island in 1943, didn't they? Yeah, yeah it was along the northern coast. Along, all along the northern mm -hmm. coast. Uh, did that fighting that was going on there, did that impact on you guys? No. Well, no? The, only, the, only way, uh, the only thing that impacted us is we knew when an invasion was impending. Uh, we would, by the materials we were loading on ships, we knew that somewhere, somehow, we didn't know where, but somewhere, somehow, there was going to be an invasion. It would be, you know, what islands or whatever. Well, tell me a little bit about what kind of clues, what kind of equipment were you loading on the ship or taking well, off yeah. the ship that you would obviously give you an idea? We loaded everything from toothpaste to cement <laughs> and uh, ammunition, bombs, yeah. and all, all of that. What would be a change? Well, here comes a ship in and you've got to load it. Is that right? You would load the ship? Yeah. What would be an indication to you that there was going to be some action somewhere? What kind of supplies well, would you have been putting on okay, that particular? Okay, you're putting the you're putting the ammunition out. Okay. And uh, another one was uh, pontoon. I don't know if you ever seen pictures of pontoon barges or not. Yes, I have. They were uh, sections of uh, steel cubes put together. Yes. And they used them for piers. Well, they would 
fabricate them, and we would put them on the side of a ship that was going out. When it was going out, we knew someplace, somewhere, someone was going to have an invasion. Yes. And what uh, what they would do is that LST was going in towards shore, they would cut them loose, and they would float right into shore. Port, set up of like a portable Yeah, docking. it would be a wharf, yeah. someplace yeah. for ships I mean, to dock yeah. and unload supplies. I'm interested if you ever got any feedback. Uh, you know, you're sitting there and a bunch of your guys are loading this. I'm imagining you back there, 19 years old, on this dock and loading the ship and talking about something happening. Does that sound like a scenario that would be? I would, I would say yes. Uh, did you ever get any feedback as to whether you were right or not? Did, did anybody ever come back and no, say, uh -uh. so you didn't know about any of this until after the until war? After, no, we knew it uh, after the newspaper. It was in the newspapers or whatever, you know. Yes. Then we put two and two together and say, hey, we loaded the stuff on that ship to, to go up there. Okay, that, that's what I was getting yeah. at. So you would have some sense of being able to, to put this all together. This was, I think, and you can help me out here too, this was a part of MacArthur's strategy of island hopping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were using this island and take that and then take that island and working their way back up, back up to, is, is, that, is, that, is that right? Yeah. That that's what it's all. Did you ever see any of those high brass people? Did anybody like that ever come through your no. particular area or any no. the scuttlebutt about any of that sort of thing? So you're on your own little world here. Yeah, on right. This. How long were you there? 23 months. A long time to be yeah. sitting on that rock. Yeah. What'd you do day by day to, to occupy yourselves when you're not loading ships? Usually we was busy most of the time. Uh, another, another reason we had, uh, another indication we had that something was coming up is we would work six hour shifts. You'd work a six hours on and six hours off. Uh -huh. And in that six hours off, you had to sleep and wash and do whatever you had to do. Yeah. But uh, uh, we had the ball fields. We made a big. Well, let me ask you this then: uh, if, if you were, you're working six hours on, six hours off, if something was going to happen, would that shift change? Would you maybe then have to work? No, no. That's when we had to work six hours on, six oh, off. Oh, okay, okay. That was when normal. The normal were day was about eight hours. Okay. Okay. Yes. But then we'd get in a position where we'd have to work six on and six off. And so then that was obviously right. more intense. You, then you started to say about ball fields. Baseball field? Yeah, we had a baseball field. Uh, they carved out for us out of the island. And uh, we had a movie theater. We had recreation halls. And uh, I don't know if Mike told you anything or not, but uh, my son. But uh, we had quite uh, barber shops. Uh, a little city, in fact. Well, you tell me some about it, because uh, 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 um, well, how your typical day would have been. Let's 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 take a day when there wasn't an intense uh, need to load a ship with. with oh, there was always a need. If you weren't loading, you were unloading. So you're every day. Every day. Yeah. This is a really busy job. thing coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So tons and tons of stuff is is coming in and out yeah. of this place. Um, that's your job. So. Uh, you, you, you put in your eight-hour day doing that job, and then you're sort of free, and you have some things to go do. So tell me what you and your buddies would have done. Uh, well, we either, like I say, we played ball or we went to the movies you, at individual night. Individual baseball and, teams, pickup teams. Do you have any kind of leagues? Yeah, pickup teams, yeah. Yeah, so just spur of the moment sort yeah. of stuff, yeah. Movies every night? Every night. Same movie, probably, on a lot of different... Yeah, they had quite a few different changes, you know. With all those yeah. ships coming in. Yeah, you they, they would trade movies, you know. The ship would come in and pick up maybe the movies that uh, we had already seen, and they'd drop off a couple. And that would be an advantage yeah. of having a constant thing back and forth. You said they had a barber shop? They had a barber shop. Well, who, who, is, who is the man in the barber shop? Uh, military personnel? Oh, yeah. And you had... Is this uh, all military? Yeah. The whole base? No, the whole everything. Air? You had a sick bay and... Uh, you had the barber shop. You had uh, a complete dental office. I mean, the, everything was there. You lived in a tent. Lived in a tent. There was uh, six of us to a tent, and it was raised up off of the ground. And uh, we had <laughs> managed to get some plywood, which they gave us. Yeah. And we built a box. And you had to put a light bulb in that box to dry your clothes overnight. For six months. She, you had wet weather, and for six months you had dry weather. Okay. So, 
How were those tents in the wet weather? No, they, did, did they repel water? Or? Well, they repelled water. I mean, uh, there was no problem there, but uh, everything was damp and muddy. Muddy, yeah. And then uh, sometimes you had to go out and clean away some of the jungle because it would grow up overnight. That fast? Mm-hmm. Clean it away with your bulldozers and all your Bulldozers are by hand with machetes or any way we can uh, cut it back. See, to me, I, I just thought that was dangerous. Uh, snakes and bugs and that kind of thing. Did you oh, it's, it was bugs. We had to take uh, at, what they called Adderburn tablets for malaria. Okay. And you had to take them and you, uh, you were issued it. I mean, it, so you couldn't. And you were checked off because... Uh, you had to take it. If you didn't, you know, you, wanted to get, you didn't want to get malaria. Yeah. And it was one interesting fact was after a certain period of time of taking it, you turned yellow because it was a little yellow pill, and that sort of got into your system. And uh, the natives used to try to get them off of us, and they would dye their T-shirts and their hair, even their hair with it, yellow hair. <laughs> <laughs> so that's... Uh, how would they get them off you? Trade or just people yeah, giving them away? Yeah. You know, we did some trading with the natives. Uh, I mean, one thing you would maybe uh, leave a couple bars of soap outside your tent on the step. Then the next day you would come get up, there'd be a bunch of bananas hanging there. The soap would be gone, there'd be a bunch of bananas hanging there. <laughs> That's neat. Did you uh, talk to them? Did you, or did you, did you, were you yourself ever able to? You know, to well, they discouraged uh, the Navy. Did yeah. Why? You have any idea? Yeah, no fraternization. Yeah. They didn't want the people running around with native women or uh, trying to mess with them or yeah. you know whatever. Yes, yeah, naturally. But you guys managed to find your own ways of, of yeah. getting around. You always things. manage to find a way when you when you want to do something. You always manage to find a way to beat the system. Right. Well, I won't get into too much of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to give away any secrets here after all these years. Uh, it seems like you you had some sense of this, the the people's culture though on this island. You had some sense of how they were living, probably a kind of a primitive lifestyle for the natives on the island, and that's why they appreciated these soaps and things. But Obviously, they had stuff you guys wanted too, fresh mm. fruit and stuff like that. Yeah. You said a lot of bugs, besides the bugs of uh, mosquitoes. Yeah. Did, did they have anything for that? Any uh, bug repellents or anything, or was it just a no. matter? No. All we did was, you know, you had a mosquito netting and yeah. uh, you slept under it, and that yeah. was it. Snakes? The rest of it, you're on your own. Yeah. Poisonous snakes? Any? Well, there's snakes. Yeah. I don't know if they. Yeah, there was poisonous snakes, and there was also uh, constrictors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they, they could slither right up into your tents, I guess, because... Uh, we had one in our tent one morning. Oh. They fought long, python. <laughs> and he happened to be under my bunk. But uh, we just kicked him out, and that was it. You're a lot kinder than I would have been. I'd have yeah. been reaching for my rifle or whatever. No, uh, we had no ammunition. Okay, or an axe or Our something. rifles were all in an armory. You know, we had nothing... Uh, so once you got on there, did you ever have occasion to have to need your weapon? No. N no? Only, uh, only when we had to uh, qualify marksmanship. Yeah. You know, we'd go out to the range and that was it. So, so you guys were never actually pulled into having to defend that area? Right. That, 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 that was... That's why I keep saying it's uneventful. Well, there's other ways, and it, it's not just being shot at. What I'm imagining here is these big ships moving back and forth and the danger of falling or the danger of, you know, did, I'm certain you must have had people get hurt. Oh, yeah, we had a couple fatalities. I, I see. We had one boy accidentally shot. We had another one shot while he was at the movies. Shot while at the movies? Yeah, well, I don't know where the bullet come from. Oh, wow. It happened to be raining that night, and uh, we had ponchos, you know, to try to keep dry. Yeah. And he says, hey, he said, my poncho's leaking. He says, must be leaking someplace. And he put his hand inside, took it out, and he had blood on it. And here he, he got hit with a bullet. Jeez. Don't know where it come from. Did he die from that, or did no. he survive? No, he survived. Were there any injuries or fatalities simply from the process of doing your job with all that heavy equipment? I would think that... No, we lost one uh, overnight somehow, and nobody knew how it happened because nobody saw it happen. 
that he run a, a little tractor. He run it off the dock and it fell into the ocean on top of him. That's the kind of thing that I, I was getting at, that the, just the danger of, yeah. of doing the job uh, in, in the process, as I said, of big ships bumping against each other that people could be. Another, th another one was that uh, a fellow was in sleep, asleep in his bunk and the armory was next door and they had the guy cleaning the rifles in the armory and checking them out and one went off. They don't know how that bullet got in there, but it hit the guy in the bunk and killed him. Yeah. See, uh, there is a degree of danger. Oh, yeah, there's always the, danger. Yeah. One thing or another. Sure. And so the fact that it was uneventful, as you say, uh, may be a matter of luck or providence or something like that, but you could have you could yeah. have, you could have been hurt where could've you were. Could have been hurt. I mean, even that ship going across the ocean, uh, some of, there were troop ships attacked, weren't there? Uh, were on occasion by the enemy. Oh, yes. So just simply, yeah, there's always a danger of that submarine uh, picking you up. Yeah. So, uh, from what you we couldn't believe it was it we was going by ourselves without any escort. That's or anything what I like would. That. Yeah. I, we I, couldn't believe I've it. Heard you know, that's how about they let us go like that? Uh, I can't, that many people. I can't tell you how many other guys have told me that same story. <laughs> uh, but I guess they felt at that time it was relatively safe, you know, compared to what it used to be. I guess, or maybe they had other priorities, you know. Well, it, it could be too. Could have been it, yeah. So all in all, how would you uh, sum up or characterize your life on, on New Guinea? Uh, that's a long time to be there, nearly two years. So you period. went through at least two rain seasons. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, would you have any good memories uh, uh, of anything or any yeah, not really. I mean, we couldn't wait to get out of there, I for one thing. Yeah. How did they feed you? What, what, what was the, what was the, did you get cooked well, meals? Well, we, we had a mess hall, and uh, we got cooked meals all the time. But the only thing is that for one span of time, for six months, I think, we had nothing but spam. You can get spam cooked, you can get spam fried, you can get spam baked, you can eat any way you want it. Yeah. And that's, that's all we had. But there were times. Do you that ever eat uh, spam now? Nope. <laughs> After six months of it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there were times. And one interesting fact, and it's going a little bit beyond that, is when we were on our way home, we stopped in Pearl Harbor. And they loaded fresh milk, fresh food, all, everything, you know. Yeah. We all got sick eating it. Because your system. Because our system, you know, wasn't used to that. Yeah. I, I talked to a man with a similar situation. He said they had been eating out of their mess kits and eating canned rations, and they uh, got to sit down and they had put bread on the table, and they didn't recognize white bread. They thought it was a cake or a dessert uh, because of the kinds yeah. of food that they'd gotten used to eating all the time. Who would think that something simple as a glass of milk? Uh, you could appreciate or would it yeah, you, you would think well, we're happy to get it you know but yeah, mm -mm. yeah. couldn't couldn't stand it <laughs> and it took a while in fact uh, my stomach was still upset when I come home yeah well did you did you lose weight then when you were on the island uh, yeah I maintained my weight okay yeah uh, one thing we had that we, we found it, I don't know how we got it or where we got it we had a toaster and we would talk to the cooks and beg a loaf of bread yeah and some peanut butter. A lot of times, instead of going to the mess hall, we would make toast and eat, you know. Yeah, toast and tent. peanut butter. Coffee? Do you have a regular supply of coffee? or Your regular supply of coffee. And yeah, so you're set. Coffee and toast and yeah. peanut butter, huh? Coffee and toast. And uh, we brewed a little bit of hooch. Yeah? <laughs> well, you got to have something to get through yeah. those rainy days. Did uh, you ever get sick? Did any of this... Did any of this ever affect you, any of the malaria, no. the disease, or the weather? No. The any only thing is I had the upset stomach, and it yeah. took a while after I come home, for it, you know. Yeah, but no long-term effects no. of any. Any of uh, your friends or buddies ever get, get affected by it? Well, we had one buddy we lost from uh, jungle rot. What is jungle rot? It's where your skin starts rotting. Is away. that right? Mm -hmm. Is that from the moisture, or is it like a, do you know? or it, uh, Moisture could be a disease, a virus, or I don't know, you know. Yeah, and it was fatal. He died. He was. He he got a real good bad case of it. People got mild cases of it, but uh, treated. Uh, yeah, 
but he it took him all over. He was some eerie, incidentally. Now, that's an interesting point. I should have asked you, were these uh, men that were with you, were they, was it a localized creation? You said you, you went down to some, Pittsburgh. Some, some, yeah. You have a lot of guys from the area, or was it people from all over the... They were from all over, but there's quite a few from the area there, yeah. too. Did, did a bunch of you guys follow all the way through, from, like you said, from induction to the basic training yeah. from this area? Mm -hmm. And come back together too, then? You come back together. Okay, and you haven't been able to keep in touch with many and of them? We did for a while, and of course, some of them sort of already passed away. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about that whenever we uh, get to the post, post service years. Um, the more and more of these stories I hear, there's a, mu a lot more events for this uneventful uh, service right. that you had. I, I, this is fascinating. So, um, did you have any idea uh, that the war was coming to an end or that the United States was having successes? Was there, was, were there oh, stories? Oh, we had a little camp newspaper. They would pick up the news off the radio and they would uh, print a little newspaper and we'd keep up with things. Yeah. So you were aware of MacArthur workings yeah. all the way back up right. and, uh, and then the bombing? After, after the invasion, you know, then uh, they would, such, uh, such and such an island was invaded or? Yes. Yeah, we picked that up later. Where were you, can you remember, where you heard the news that the war was over? Yes. We were loading a ship, and we were loading motors, Packard motors, big Packard motors on that ship that they used on PT boats. And we heard that the war was over, so we happy, you know, we sort of slacked off a little bit, and we got heck from our officer. He says, the war's over for them people, but it ain't for you. He says, keep on the work. <laughs> so. How long after that? How long after the, the dropping? Let me ask, did, did any stories come back to you other than through your newspapers or whatever about the dropping of the atomic bomb? Did no, was, just what we picked up. Okay. Did it, what was your reaction to that when you heard about this particular bomb? Well, the only thing we thought that the war is going to end. You yeah, know. yeah. You Just do that much damage with that one, one bomb or two bombs, and sooner or later, then people are going to capitulate. Another weapon right. to use to bring that war to as quick as end as possible. So then it was a matter of just waiting until uh, we went home. How long was that? How long was the... Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think now. The bomb was dropped in, I believe, August. And the following March, we come home. So there was about a six-month span. I was going to say, you were still there another yeah, six months. We still months. had to, uh, one of the things we were doing is we were getting rid of equipment. Like, uh, say, an LST. Which is a, a, a it, boat? It's a boat. Okay. In landing ship tank. And they would put a LCVP in that, a smaller one, and put a Jeep in that. And it would take it out in the bay and open the sea cocks and let it go. And we were throwing a lot of equipment into the ocean because it was cheaper to throw it away than it was to bring it back. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just trying to get this, uh, all of this <coughs> stuff that they would feel they had no use for, they weren't going to leave it on that island. Right, so that's what were, we were doing, in, you know, between yeah, uh, yeah. the time the war was over and the time we come home. Okay. Now, you're still loading? You, are, are the ships, are ships still coming through on their way? Well, the ships, there was less supplies coming in. Okay. But there was more going out. Okay. Did any other troop ships ever come through there? Did you ever get to see any no. fresh? So once you guys got settled there, you became, like you said, your own little city, your own little world mm. with this outside contact of people bringing in, in the ships and, and, I'm sorry, bringing in the supplies and you guys. Mm -hmm. So the last part of your time on the island then was uh, sort of like cleaning up. Cleaning and up. Being a junk man. Yeah. Any images of what it was like to leave whenever they finally told you guys you were going home? No, the only thing they told us is that uh, there will be a ship coming in for us to go home on. Okay. We didn't know that until uh, two days before we was going to leave. And we watched for that ship. It was a converted aircraft carrier. Okay. Liberty ship converted to yeah. an aircraft carrier. How many guys got on that? It's just our outfit. 
Well, how many would that have been? That would have been uh, uh, 1,200 men. Oh, okay, because I didn't. I was thinking that that ship probably wouldn't have been big enough to yeah. carry the, all the 8,000. You know, we did, did pick some more Army personnel up at one stop in uh, Australia, because we went from, coming home, we went from New Guinea to Australia and stayed there for five days and then, and then come home. Shipping you off of the island, it was done sort of in, in segments then. Uh, came all in on a big troop ship with eight or 10,000 people, but then they took you off, started to ship you home in smaller groups. Yeah. What about replacements? Uh, it, 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 this was a self-sustaining, no? No replacements for no you? No replacements. We kept the same amount of personnel outside of the few that we lost. Yeah. So you got to know these people that you were working with, oh, the yeah. people around there, mm -hmm. there fairly well, uh, and managed to make some way of uh, some sort of a decent quality of life as best you could in all the muck and the rain and potential danger Whatever. and everything else. Yeah. So you're leaving the island now. You're you're 20 years old. Have you turned 20 yet? I mean, I guess. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah, around on the verge of being 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're so you're heading back home. And you said you left and then you went to to Australia. So you yeah. did actually get to touch Australia, at least. Yeah, we stayed five days in Sydney, Australia. Did you get off the boat? Did you get to see it? Oh, we got off the boat. But uh, we were supposed to be there nine. Uh -huh. But uh, they had some trouble with some of the people that, that when they went ashore, you know. The they state. were on the island so long, and then they just went wild when they got ashore. So the captain says, well, hey, five days is enough. We're leaving. But the, the reason we only the only reason we went there is the evaporators on the ship broke, and the evaporators is what gives you the fresh water. Okay. So they had to go down to repair them. And they were repaired so that you could. They have. were repaired. Now on the way back, did you get more water, or were you still that two quart a day? No, we got showers. Oh, that's. But uh, <laughs> salt water showers, until we hit a rain shower. In fact, we had couple of occasions where the captain would steer the ship into a rain shower. And we'd all go up on a flight deck and take a shower. <laughs> that would have been a picture. No <laughs> nurses on that ship no, coming no back. No, no nurses on that. <laughs> were the nurses, I forgot to ask you, were the nurses stationed right there? Was there a, there was a sick bay, a medical base right there on New Guinea with, with you? There were no nurses stationed with us, no. Okay. They were stationed uh, across the bay, but uh, there was only a small contingent of them. Okay. I, I, I meant to ask you that whenever you were talking about uh, being on the island. So, like I said, that would have been a great picture, a bunch of guys up there on that yeah. deck getting the showers in, in, in the rain, uh, probably feeling really good about that fresh water. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. How long did it take you to get back? Fourteen days. From, from Australia? From or? Australia to, we stopped at Pearl and then from Pearl. Uh, How long were you there at Pearl Harbor? Yeah, we, we were only there uh, one day. Did you get to see anything? No, we didn't get off the ship. Uh, I just w was was the uh, was there still a lot of wreckage there at all? Did you get to see the harbor from? No, uh -uh. it was all cleaned up. I mean. Yeah. I, I I just didn't know if by that stage that mm -hmm. I'm sure they had cleaned a lot of it up, but obviously the Arizona is still there now, so they they left some things in place. So you got a short Hawaiian vacation. Very short. <laughs> we didn't get off the ship. And like I say, we had to load that food on it, fresh food. Yes. And, uh, How long does it take to get back from, from Hawaii then to the United States? From the Hawaii to the United States, so I think it was about five or six days. I'm not really sure. Okay. Where'd you, where'd you come into? We come into Treasure Island in uh, San Francisco. Okay. And uh, right away they gave us liberty. They gave us leave because they couldn't handle that many people. So we were in San Francisco for, I believe, three or four days. And then we got on a troop train to come home. We come up to Sampson, New York, from where we were discharged. You were discharged up in New York? Mm -hmm. How long did it take to get across the country on that train? Uh, four and a half, five days. That's amazing. <laughs> taking a long time. Yeah. Well, I think troop trains, you know, they... That must have seemed forever to you to be that close. It, <laughs> it just not ending, huh? Yeah. Did your family know you were on the way home? Oh, yeah. I called them from San Francisco when we got there. They had a telephone at the house where you could you could call straight? No, no. We, uh, 
call from the hotel we were in. Okay. And your family here had a phone in their home that you could call straight? No, they had the neighbors. I had to call the neighbors, and they had to call the family over. I, could, I asked that deliberately because I, a lot of guys have told me the same thing, yeah. that they didn't own a phone, and there was like one phone in the neighborhood. Yeah, in the neighborhood, and everybody called there, and yeah. that was it. Yeah. What a change, as we were saying before, in the way we communicate now. Yeah. That have known every sec step by step where you were on the way home. So you're in New York. And you were discharged in New York? Sampson, New York. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly sure where Sampson, New York is in relation to us here. How'd you get from New York back home? Well, we had two ways. We could have waited until they got enough people to fill up a train for, to go from New York to Pittsburgh, or we could pay our own way. And they give us, I think they give us $8 a piece, and we hired a bus. Forty of us hired a bus, and we come home. One of us from Pittsburgh. We hired a bus and come into Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. And then from Pittsburgh, I come home on a trolley. <laughs> and what time of the day do you do you remember? Do you have that image in your mind of coming home? What time did I come home? Yeah, I mean, do you have that image whenever you got to see your family again? Yeah, it was about uh, let's see. Two, it was about two o'clock in the morning, because <laughs> I got the last trolley out of Pittsburgh. Uh huh. You didn't go out to Roscoe at 2 o'clock. Wake everybody up in the house? They were all up. They were waiting? Yeah. That must have been an incredible feeling yeah. to be able to see them again. Of course, a little bit sad without your dad there, I'm sure. Yeah. That, would have been, that would have been tough. I can see that that still causes you some a little bit of... Oh, it does. I can imagine. That, that's, a, that's a tough thing. So, now you're back home. What happens now? What's the rest of your life, Tay? Well, I went back to work. At Corning again? Corning again. Oh. Got my job back. Okay. And uh, before it was all over, I ended up putting 50 years in Corning. <laughs> so that was all my life there. Mm -hmm. So you lived in uh, the area then all that time? All that time. Mm -hmm. did you, in Roscoe? Or did, did no, no. I got married in, uh, yeah, I got up 47. Married in 47. Did you know this lady before the service? No. Met after? Met after. From the, obviously from the area since you, you stayed here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Met her in Shawroy. Okay. <laughs> and moved into? And then eventually into moved into uh, North Shawroy. And that's where you've been? Mm-hmm. That's where I spent the rest of my life. So so you're, you're coming on to or have passed the 60th anniversary with this lady? You said, didn't you say four? Yes. We uh, had 60 years. Let's see. We were married in 47. Yep. This year we had 60 years. Well, you better tell me your name because uh, your grandchildren see this and you don't mention their grandma's name. What's oh, what? grandma's name was Ann. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. That's very good. 60 years. That, mm -hmm. That's a remarkable accomplishment, yeah. too. I've been blessed to do that. Children? How many children? Uh, three children. Three children? And... Uh, I have one daughter, she's the oldest, and uh, Michael, okay. and a younger son. And your children have all gone out and made you very proud? Oh, yeah. The uh, girl was going to be uh, 60 next year, and she had two children, and they have two children. So, so you're a great-grandpa. I'm a great-grandpa, five times. Five times. <laughs> That's another great yeah. blessing. So... Uh, and then Mike, of course, you know Mike. Oh, yes. Mike. Then the youngest one, he's out in California. He's an architect. He graduated from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Oh. And uh, from there he went to Texas, from Texas to D.C., and now he's out in California. Well, I know you're proud of your children, and oh, I'm yeah. sure they're very proud of you. I'm sure they're very proud. Now, you were involved and active in some veterans' organizations. Yeah, I got involved in veterans' organizations, and... Uh, which one in particular, which one did well, you belong the, to? The first, first one was, uh, I joined the VFW, but I wasn't quite active, you know, when I first started Shaw out. Shawroy Post or? Shawroy Post. And then uh, they had at that time the Catholic War veterans. And I had, uh, I joined them, and I eventually ended up as being commander for two years in the Catholic War veterans. And then uh, they sort of fell through, and I went back and uh, got into the, uh, 
Veterans Council in Shawai, which was composed of uh, the VFW and the uh, American Legion yeah. and all of the veterans organizations. And I spent about 14 and a half, 15 and a half years as Veterans Council. Mm -hmm. in, uh, planning parades and veterans planning, yeah. memorial. I had heard that you were very active in the honor guard up there uh, uh, for the military funerals. Yeah, at one time. You had the job of taking care of all the weapons that were used in the right. salute. And I had them in my house and I used to drag them out and <laughs> clean them and whatever. Yeah. Uh, back in those days, I probably it was a lot easier to find men that would be able to serve as pallbearers and, and oh, yeah. squads mm -hmm. and things like that. Are you still active at all to any extent? No, not. No. You're still a member, though? No, oh, I'm still I'm a life member. Yeah. In the VFW. Yes, yes. And I, I keep up my membership in the American Legion. Find those organizations to be really worthwhile uh, in terms of uh, helping out other veterans. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not many. I don't. Doesn't seem as many of the younger veterans right now are, are in, interested in joining as as your generation was. No, they're not. Uh -uh. Maybe as they get older. It seems to me as they're getting the we're the more Vietnam veterans are yes. joining now because yes. they're getting older, you know. I guess that's part of it. I, 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 they're getting more active. Yeah, I, I guess so. Well, that's good because yeah. then they can take care of. Yeah, they have uh, to because we're dying out. Well, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and to take care of it, like just as you guys came back and the World War One veterans were aging, and you you took care of them. It's it's you know people deserve be taken care of and you're in that stage. Is there anything I've left out? This has been a fascinating story and, and the time is, is, is zipped by as we've been talking. Uh, uh, I feel like I know you. I have this very solid image in my mind of this young man that went off and experienced all those things and then came home to make some important, continuing important uh, contributions to society. Is there anything I've left out, anything that uh, you would like to mention? As I said, imagine your great-grandchildren or someone down the line. That uh, is there an anecdote or a story yeah, that we I passed think, I think over? I think we covered the bases pretty good. Well, I hope you realize now that it was far from uneventful. Uh, no, it's still uneventful to me. Well, I think that whoever was watching this will be saying, "Well, we somewhat we disagree with that." As I said, I, I I know you're very proud of your family, and they have every reason to be proud of you. I, I want to thank you for coming up here and, and sharing all of this with us today. Um, yeah, I, I, I have truly enjoyed it. And I want to thank you for, well, thank for your you service. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for your service to your country. And as I said, your continuing service okay. even after you were out, out of the Navy and in the CVs. And, and I think this is going to be a, a very interesting story. If yeah. you want to come. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.